Today I want to share something a bit different. I'm going to take some painting references from a video game. Now, if you haven't looked at video game for a while, you might be wondering what video games can offer as a painting reference because your perception of video game is this. Well, not exactly. The video game I'm looking at actually looks like this. And I turned that into a watercolor painting. So keep watching as I share my whole process. Hi, this is Eric from Cafe Watercolor. I'm a full-time video game artist, so I am somewhat familiar with game industry. The graphic technology has been vastly improved over the last decade or so. It's capable of creating very believable and sometimes even realistic graphics. Because 3D graphics are now so advanced, Quite a few games have photography mode. It allows players to use the in-game camera to take screenshots, or in other words, real digital photography. Most of the photography mode in the game allow you to move the camera in the given area freely. You can tweak the camera settings such as zoom level and exposure and things like that. Some of the game will even let you change the time of the day, weather, and even allow you to change expression and poses of the characters, giving you lots of freedom to create an image. Here are some of the images I took from video games. Now, when I took screenshots of a game, I did think about painting some of them with watercolor. But just like taking photos during a trip, not all screenshots are suitable for painting some are great for computer wallpapers though. All that being said, I want to share you the process of taking some screenshots in a video game called A Plague Tale Requiem, share some tips on composing an image, and then share with you the painting process of this painting. Okay, let's jump into it. So this is a cutscene before we start this part of the game. So what's really cool about this game is that I can actually pause during the cutscene, we will be able to access photo mode, which is pretty rare in the video game because most of the video games during the cutscene, the camera is completely fixed and you can you can take screenshot, but you are not able to move the camera whatsoever. In this game, you can actually do that. So as you can see, the game is really, really beautiful and the lightings and architectural details are very well done. So props to the team the studio, Sobo Studio, who made this beautiful game. What I'm going to do is just to kind of almost like a tourist in a way to kind of walk around the place. I'm not going to trigger any event or something. I'm just going to walk around and see if there's any scene that can potentially be a very good painting subject. So we're looking for good shapes, uh, good lighting, and maybe colors, but I'm mostly about shapes and lighting. So there's actually a lot of stuff that's suitable for a very nice painting just because of the lighting. And again, because it is made by a team and this is specifically made for a video game experience, a lot of this environment and sceneries are made for it to look pretty. So it's actually very dense. Like there's not a lot of empty area that's, that looks boring. And here we actually got a quite a decent scene. I feel there's a little bit too many buildings, but that looks pretty nice. And one thing that I usually like to do, especially if I want to paint the main character is we need to find a way for them to pop out. So in this case, the buildings are not lit. They are a little bit darker and our main characters are lit by the sun. So you can see them sort of pop out in front of the building. Now there's still quite a bit of detail in the shadow just because it is a sunny day. There's a lot of bounce light and stuff, but this is the general idea. Look at all the butterflies and the foliages and flowers. It's just so nice. And you can also see how beautiful the lighting is like right next to the stairs. For example, the amount of bounce from the floor to the wall. And you can see that even though it is in the shadow, you see quite a bit of bounce light and the warmth of the bounce light. So that's how advanced the video game graphics has become. It's become very realistic and believable. So this is a wonderful scenery. I really like this one, like just the amount of depths it brings. I am going to see if I can take a screenshot here. So we'll put them here. 
maybe a little bit back so that they can be lit by the sun. I'll enter the photo mode. I will pull it out a little bit. And this is great. But look at all this lighting. Look at all the shadows casted by the trees in the surrounding. The main characters are lit and they pop a lot against the dark background. And now I can actually tweak the camera so I can make it a much wider angle. But you can see that it's starting to look a little bit unnatural because of the extreme perspective, especially for the building. It looks kind of odd. So I will pull back and I will actually, oops, I will actually zoom in a little bit like that. And I will lift the camera up a little bit. So something like that, we can always adjust the image later in Photoshop in any sort of a photo editing program. And maybe I'll lift the camera up just a little bit, something like that. This is actually a great scene. Oh, I love the chicken. So uh, let's hope we can kind of include them here. My goodness, is this horse poop? <laughs> wow, the amount of detail is amazing. Okay, so I actually like this quite a bit. If we want to have the character in front of the, the light building, then we can take a photo like these. So in this way, the character have strong silhouette against the background. Yeah, so maybe something like that. Again, we can definitely crop it afterwards. And now let's move our characters a little bit. So in this case, they're in the light again. It will be like the last shot. We can actually have them pop in front of the shadow that casted by the buildings on the left. So I'm going to quit the game and look at a screenshot that we took and maybe process them a little bit. Okay, so I took a couple of screenshots and here they are. And I actually took quite a bit more, but I pick a few just to show you some examples. So this is one of them. I actually able to manage to get the chicken over here. So it got the light in front of the shadow, which looks great. So I'm using ultra wide monitor. So whenever I took a screenshot, it is always ultra wide, which looks great. You know, almost looks like a movie, but for painting, there's a lot of needless stuff on the side. So I'll usually try to crop it down. I usually go with four by three ratio because the paper I use is usually about four by three ratio. So I will crop it to that ratio by using the root of third grid. We can place the character around this area. So if we crop it down like that and maybe a little bit more, we will be able to have the character in the frame. Now it looks much more important because originally the character is only a small part of the painting. Now we get to almost 30% of the picture. It will look pretty good. And I really like the light and dark of this building right here. And that, and that shadow line leads your eyes to the character. Now the chicken on the side is a little bit too close to the edge and that creates this uncomfortable tangency. So what I'm going to do is just to copy it in front of the picture and I'll move a little bit over here. So a little bit of the Photoshop magic, but this is just to show you that you can tweak the picture like that. And even if you don't have Photoshop, that's okay. You can always move things around when you are doing your drawing and painting. So this screenshot, I wasn't really planning to paint it. I took this screenshot because I saw it will be a nice desktop wallpaper because I usually have my icons layout to the left. And this is really a nice, dark, empty areas. Now I can still paint it if I want to, but again, I'll have to crop it. So maybe I will crop it down like that. We don't have to include this lamp right here. Just so something like that. So maybe we can have the character 
here as a focus, the character working, something like that, and the sparrows have some interesting lighting and shape as well. And I took this screenshot, maybe I can use that as a portrait reference. And we can also kind of appreciate how much detail they put in for the texture. And you can see the pores and the skin texture and everything. She doesn't have perfectly smooth, portless skin, which makes it quite realistic. And if you look at the leather and her scarf, all the fibers and stuff, even the little tiny furry edges of the scarf, it's just quite amazing. And it's a very beautiful lighting as well. So I might use that for a portrait painting reference. And I took this screenshot because of the water is really, really beautifully done. You can see the transparency of the water and see all the rock underneath, even the foams and some very, very beautiful reflections here. So something like that might be really, really good. We don't have to include a lot of stuff on the side. So maybe something like that was the character here. And now to this screenshot, which is the screenshot that we're going to paint. Again, because of my ultra wide monitor, the screenshot is very, very wide. It's very cool looking. It's a very wide angle cinematic shot, but then we have a lot of this extra stuff that we don't need. So we'll probably need to crop it down as well. Again, four by three ratio is usually my go-to ratio. So we can crop it down like that. I like the building in the middle, so I would like to keep that. But even if we crop it down, I still feel there's too much empty spaces around it. So we want to make the character a little bit more important. So we don't want these empty areas on the side. So what I'm going to do is to change the orientation to more of a vertical portrait orientation. So now when we crop it, this looks a lot more dynamic in a way. The characters are here, nicely positioned in the lower left corner, and we get to see the full view of the center building. And we get to see the tunnel, which gives a very nice sense of depth. And we still have the buildings and the rock on the side, just a little bit to establish the depths and as a foreground element. One thing that I will probably do is to make this character bigger. Now, when we do that, need to be a little bit careful so that it still looks somewhat natural, but not out of scale. And this actually looks a little bit more natural than their original state. And that's something I kind of want to explain a little bit because when you're building an environment for a video game, you want to compensate for the wide angle lens that's right behind the character. In this case, this is a third person view. So in a game, like you see earlier, you get to see the character. But if the camera angle is not wide enough, you will only see the character and it will obstruct most of the environment because you're so close to the character. So usually what they do is to make a wide angle camera and put it behind the character. That way you get to see a good portion of a character, but you can still have a very good view of the environment. And what we call in video game is field of view, FOV. So usually it has a very big wide FOV so you can see the character and the environment. So when you have a large FOV, like a wide angle, what's going to happen is the environment is going to start to look small, just like when you use like a fish eyes lens or something like that. So to compensate for that in video game, they will make the environment much bigger. They will make the architecture bigger and even a little bit out of the scale in a way, it's just so that you can see the character and still see everything else in the relatively natural looking scale. So that's why when you're looking at this screenshot, if you look carefully, the bricks and the tiles are so much bigger than the character that the character looks almost kind of miniature in a way like this dry grass and stuff, they all look so big. So now when we make the character larger, it actually looks a little bit more natural. So that's what I'm going to go with when I am doing my painting. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the process of this painting. First of all, I am doing a value study for this specific painting. This is to help me simplify the scenery that I'm about to paint. So the key is to connect as many shapes as possible so that we can make the image easy to read. So we got this huge shadow casting by some trees on the left and that connects to the dark inside of the tunnel. And that also connect with the characters and then connect with the cast shadows on the ground and the buildings on the right. This first layer, this first wash, is the middle value. The light value is the white of the paper. So the middle value is usually the major shape of the painting. And then after we're done connecting as much shape as possible into this middle value shape, now I go back in and paint the dark value. The dark values are the smaller shapes that's usually within the middle value, the major shape. So that when we do that, we can separate the shapes. So as I paint, you can see as things are becoming more dimensional and a lot more defined just by adding another layer of value. And all of a sudden, the middle value doesn't seem as dark anymore. It can actually become much lighter. And you can see when I paint the dark in the tunnel and the cast shadow on the left, the characters are starting to pop out and they become part of the light. And again, I learned this process from Andy Evenson. He is a wonderful mentor, a teacher, and a friend. So really credit goes to him. And his process really helps me to simplify my painting. Here is the finished value study. It's very loose, very rough. But if this works, if this reads, we can use this as a blueprint for our color painting. Okay, so let's start our colored painting. Since this is going to be our finished product, I'm going to spend just a little bit more time doing the drawing. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were recompose our images, I want to make the character a little bit bigger and that can actually make this thing look a little bit more natural because oftentimes video game need to build their props and their buildings a little bit bigger to balance out the wide FOV that they're using. And something that I didn't mention earlier, another reason why we often use larger FOV is because if you use FOV that's too narrow, when a character moving around, when a camera rotating, it's much easier to get motion sickness. So when we have a wider field of view, when we rotate around, it doesn't feel as drastic. Things doesn't move as fast as they appear to be. So the funny thing is that even though my day job is a video game artist, I actually don't have as much time to play video game anymore because I get really busy with my day job, running this YouTube channel, and then also taking care of my family. But once in a while, when the game really caught my eyes, I will still try to take a little bit of time playing it. And because I'm a digital artist myself, when I'm playing the video game, I tend to take it a little bit slower, look around, really appreciate the art the development team put in the game. And especially when a game having really fun gameplay as well as a very well-written, engaging story and they have really good pacing, it's really an enjoyable experience, much more than simply sitting there and watching a movie. Now, I love movie, but when a video game is really well made, I really enjoyed it as a piece of art. Okay, back to the painting. Got a little bit carried away because of my love for a video game. So here we start the first wash. Now I'm pre-wetting the sky area because I want some soft shape for the sky and the tree. The first wash is painting the color of the light. So we can have a little bit more water in our first wash. And don't worry about when the color blending with each other. That's exactly what we want for the first wash. We want to stay loose. Let watercolor do its thing. If the color blend with each other naturally, let it be. We can always tighten things up when we are painting our second wash and third wash. So here I'm trying to give a color for the building as well. Even though it is lit directly by the sun, 
you still see this bright orange color because of the bricks. So that's why I said the first wash is all about the color of the light. Even though we're painting some colors, they are the light value. And if you refer to the value study on the left, the light value that I'm painting right now is actually just the white of the paper in the value study. So I'm constantly referring back to my value study because that is the map, that is my blueprint. I will try to stick with it. However, because now that we're introducing color, I am going to have a little bit more fun playing with the color, adding warm and cool in my painting. So I'm also painting the skin tone and the hair color for the characters. And now I'm painting the second wash which is the first watch that I paint in the value study. So same thing, I start with the roof. So usually I paint from top to bottom. I tilt my paper a little bit, so the wash will naturally flow down. So the roof is a little bit of this warm gray color, but I also add a little bit of cool in it. And now I am going to add some warmer color on the bottom because of the bounce light from all the bricks and the warm elements in the scene. Connect to the roof on the left. And again, add some warm colors on the bottom of the roof. Paint some quick texture for the bricks. You don't have to paint individual bricks. We don't really see them anyways. So just a little bit of variation to break up the big empty area. But keep it middle value and a little bit lighter. Connect the shape to the right, to the building on the right. Continue underneath the roof, and then we connect the shape to the cast shadow on the buildings on the right. Leave out a little bit of the light here and there. Now I use a paper towel to press and lift some of the paint that I just painted. When you have a wash that's still very wet, you can use this technique to lift a little bit to get some light back. So just press it with paper towel, don't scrub it. And sometimes you can get some nice soft lighting effect, like the shape on the right. It's quite nice. But you need to make sure you do that while it is still wet. If it's dry, no matter how hard you press it, it's not going to work. Continue my way down and while the wash of the bricks are still wet, I added a little bit more color just to create some variations. So I can kind of get ahead of myself and add a little bit darker values already. But the main task at hand is to continue the middle value shape. So I connect that to the cast shadow on the left, as well as the tunnel. So I'm going to try to preserve some light of the vine by painting around them. Just leave a little bit of the light. So that's why it doesn't really matter if the first wash, the color kind of bleed out and blend with other color, because as soon as you paint the middle value, you can define the light shape a lot easier and continue connect the shape to the bottom and connect that to the cast shadow that casted by the trees and the characters and as you can see the colors are still quite simple but i just try to introduce a little bit of different warms and cools so that we can have a little bit of richness in this simplified loose painting and that connect to the character. They are all part of the same shape. I just changed the color around. But they are pretty much all middle value right now. The shoulders are white because of her shirt. So I paint around that. Now I continue to paint the left side. And as you can see, as I slow down to paint around the characters, the wash is dry. But if you have a similar enough value and color, it will blend right in. A little bit of hard edge doesn't really matter. 
connect to the shadow on the rock and connect to the cast shadows on the ground. So as you can see, my brush strokes are pretty loose and that is why to have a simplified shape is important. Otherwise, it's just going to look like a mess. If I have loose, spontaneous brush strokes and also a bunch of different little shapes, it's going to be really tired to look at and it's going to look very confusing. So that's why value study is quite important for me to simplify the painting and connect the shapes. And now I'm painting the third layer, which is the dark value. So starting from the darker trees on the top, the branches and the leaves. And again, keep them nice and loose and connect them as much as possible as well. So the dark trees connect to the roof. And as we paint the dark shade in the roof, we start to feel the structure of the building. So it's important that you paint layer by layer because when you paint the middle value first, it's much easier to lay on top of that and create a dark value. If you want to paint a dark value straight away, you need to use a lot more paint. And that's usually harder to paint because it's drier. The paint is not going to flow as well. So adding some more dark back to the building. And everything just come together. Once you establish a good major shape, it's much easier from that point forward. And we can finish our painting pretty rapidly. And also because we have a solid plan, a solid blueprint, which is our value study, it took a lot of the guesswork out. So I continue to paint the dark into the tunnel. And I deliberately make the tunnel a little bit darker. So even though they are all dark value, I can make it just a little bit darker to push the depth and do some wet onto wet inside of the dark shape to add a little bit subtle details within it. And as we paint, we can see how the lighting artists work in this scenery. So we have this nice shadow casting on the building and the tunnel. But after the tunnel, we see another building that's lit by the sun and then another dark tunnel. So that really draws your eye in. And a lighting artist in a video games is not just trying to make the scene looks pretty, but also try to guide the players so the player knows where to go in a very natural way without using signs and arrows and stuff. So I'm continue adding the dark value to the brick on the right. And some grasses that's growing from the ground. We make them darker so they separate from the shadow and adding some dark on the character so they look a little bit more dimensional and actually make the lighting stronger on them. Keep your brush stroke loose and simple, as few brush strokes as you can to build up the shape. And here is the finished painting. Even though I'm painting from a video game screenshot, I still treat it as a real scenery. And I really like the result of the painting and I really enjoy this painting as well. Maybe one day we can go into the virtual world and do plein air in a virtual space. That might be very interesting. But for now, I still like the feeling of using a real paintbrush, mixing colors and paint it on the paper. That's just the joy and enjoyment that I wouldn't get in my day job. I enjoy working digitally, but painting watercolor is really a special treat for me. So even though I love taking screenshots from video games and paint them, I still consider them to be fine art because they are still the creation of a studio. The reason it looks so beautiful in a game is that all the buildings, props, characters, lightings, and everything you see in the game are made to deliver a great visual experience for the players. So it is already art directed. 
It is definitely very fun to paint them, but I was still trying to get inspiration from the real world as well. We are getting close to the end of 2022. Because of my day job, I wasn't able to do as many updates as I wanted, but I really appreciate your support. One of the happiest things that happened to me this year was the release of my paintbrush set. And it is already sold out. Some friends asked me if they can still get it. I don't know since I'm not the manufacturer. However, if you miss your chance and you still wish to get a brush set, please visit Craftmo's website and click on the notification button. If the demand is there, they will likely do another batch. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, please consider like and subscribe. Ring the bell icon so you will get a notification whenever I put out a new video. I wish you a wonderful day wherever you are. I'm Eric from Cafe Watercolor. See you next time.